Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be back with you and thankful for the opportunity to, to open God's Word uh, with you tonight. As some of you have figured out, I am not from Texas. <laughs> and so I have a request at, at the onset is to please overlook some of the words that you might not grasp at the beginning. I can assure you I'm, I'm learning the accent uh, and learning very soon. So. <laughs> So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll be looking at a few verses at the end of that chapter. Verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Turn a few books in New Testament after 1 Corinthians to Hebrews. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12. And verses 1 to verse Three, verse 1 to verse 3. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or weight and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The idea of modern marathon was inspired by a legend of an ancient Greek messenger who raced from a place called Marathon to Athens which is a distance of about 40 kilometers, or 25 miles. And he raced with the news of the important Greek victory over an invading army of the Persians in 490 BC. After making the announcement, he was so exhausted that he collapsed and he died. But to commemorate his dramatic run, the distance of the 1896, which is the beginning of the modern Olympics, the Olympic marathon was set to be at 40 kilometers. For those of us in the U.S., uh, it is 25 miles, as I mentioned before. And for the next few Olympics, the length of the marathon remained close to about 25 miles. But in the 1908 Games in London, the course was extended. Uh, and it was extended allegedly to include and accommodate the British royal family. The story goes, Queen Alexandra requested that the race start on the lawn of the Windsor Castle, uh, and she requested this so, apparently so that the lo most littlest members of the royal family could watch the, the beginning of the race and finish it in front of the royal box at the Olympic Stadium, a distance that happened to be 26.2 miles. And the random boost in mileage end ended up sticking, and in 1921, the length of the marathon was formally standardized to 26.2 miles. You know, frequently in the scriptures we find that the writers compare the Christian life uh, to a race. Not a sprint, uh, but a longer race, perhaps a marathon kind of a race. And we've just read two passages where Paul, the author of Corinthians, and then the unknown author of Hebrews makes the case that we are in a race. And as followers of Christ, we can tend to forget that we are in a race. Uh, when hurdles and difficulties come, we can tend to behave as though we are not in a race. And these verses that we have just read and which we will take a closer look at remind us that the case is otherwise. 
Paul uses the metaphor of the race to show us what the Christian life is like. The figure is an athlete running a race, and Paul is comparing the believer uh, living the Christian life to the athlete. Now, this is one of Paul's uh, most loved expressions to tell us what the Christian life is like. For example, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, which is one of the earliest New Testament books to be written, uh, Paul writes this, It was because of a revelation that I went up and submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain uses the same expressions, expression in Philippians chapter 2. At the end of verse 16, he says, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. Paul loved using this expression to describe the Christian life. And of the ten times that this word run is used in the New Testament, in the epistles, Paul uses this term nine times. And if you attribute Paul as the writer of Hebrews, then ten out of ten times. Clearly, Paul loved this expression. Uh, This was Paul's way of telling the followers of Christ the kind of path or the journey they were on. Our first text then comes from 1 Corinthians as we looked at it. So turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 as we consider this particular portion of scriptures. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in 56 AD when he was in Ephesus on his third missionary journey. And some believers from Corinth came to Paul with reports from the household of Chloe concerning quarrels in the church at Corinth. Uh, Paul hears these reports. He's disturbed when he hears the reports and writes in response to the reports as well as responding to a few other questions that the believers in Corinth had. Now, just to give you a context, first century Corinth was a leading commercial center of southern Greece. Uh, The city was very well known, or rather infamous, uh, for its immorality immorality and paganism. And, And in spite of the great difficulties, with God's help, Paul plants a church there during his second missionary journey. Uh, which is mentioned in Acts chapter 18. Now, this church was both gifted and and growing. Uh, However, it continued to be plagued with moral issues, ethical issues, uh, doctrinal issues, and very practical issues. And Paul deals with all of them in the first uh, epistle to the Corinthians. But apart from being a leading commercial center, Corinth was also the host city of the Isthmian Games. Uh, The Isthmian Games took place in Isthmus, uh, and for those of us who are Uh, geographically challenged, what that is, is a narrow piece of land between two water bodies. Uh, It was near Corinth, and and that was the host of the Isthmian Games. And they took place every two years uh, in in conjunction with the Olympics and the Pythian Games. And they were open to all sorts of different Athenians and, and, uh, and, and Greeks. Now, with that as a background, we can now understand why Paul's favorite expression is, is Christian in the race. I want to share with you as we look at these verses that we have in front of us, uh, four things. First of all, the reality of the race. Uh, The reality of the race. We are all in a race. Secondly, we'll consider the aim of the race. Uh, What is the goal uh, that we must have as we participate in this race? Thirdly, our conduct in the race. Uh, How must we behave What are the rules of the game? What are some of the attributes that we must be concerned about as we run this race? And fourthly and finally, our example in the race, our example in the race. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Paul writes there, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? So run in such a way that you may win. You know, Paul begins with a rhetorical question. Do you not know? Uh, If you are a follower of Christ, you are in a race. If you are a follower of Christ, you are in a race. Now, unlike the competitive races that we see in different arenas, in this race, you're not competing against other fellow believers. Uh, It does not matter how young you are or how old you are. Uh, It does not matter how physically overweight underweight or perfectly weighed you are, 
Uh, it does not matter whether you're a male or a female. It, it does not matter what the color of your skin is. It does not matter the nationality you come from or the culture you come from. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a part of this race. And this race begins when you, in repentance and faith, place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your only hope for being right with God. In other words, this race begins when you become a Christian. And there are only two ways that this race comes to an end. Either it will end when the Lord returns, just as he promised, or it will end if you die. And the most interesting part of this race is that it is God who calls you to this race. Uh, Philippians 3.14, Paul writing to the Philippians, he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Uh, you know, Paul is not talking from a second-hand experience. Paul has closely seen the races in Corinth. In fact, we have historical evidence to show that the races that Paul is referring to, or perhaps has a background of, took place in 51 AD. And Paul was in Corinth during that time in his second missionary journey. Uh, Corinth, as I mentioned earlier, was an important city. It was a city where the maritime routes went through both uh, water as well as the road routes went through this city. And Paul, as we've been studying, and even Romans had a desire to reach his own kinsmen. There were, it, were, it was a place where a large Jewish community existed, and as, well, as was Paul's custom, he would go and approach his own kinsmen as he evangelized. But the third important reason for Paul being in Corinth was the Isthmian Games that I mentioned earlier. And these games then took place at a time when Paul was evangelizing in Corinth. Uh, the games were kind of an opportunity for Paul the evangelist, uh, to, to preach Christ at these games. Now, at these games, there was no permanent accommodation, and therefore people stayed in tents uh, surrounding the fields where the games took place. And so fixing or selling tents would have given Paul and his companions Aqu Aquila and Priscilla the kind of entry they needed to be at those games. And so Paul is, has seen these games firsthand. He knows what it is that he's talking about. But just like any metaphor, the comparison should not be stretched beyond a certain limit. So unlike the athletic competitions which last just for a few seconds or perhaps for a few minutes or hours, the Christian race lasts for the life of the participant. So if you aren't dead yet, you aren't finished yet. Uh, the race is to test not your speed but your endurance and your perseverance. So you're not competing against Christians other believers in this race, you're fighting against your own flesh and perhaps sinful desires that have beset at you. You're fighting against the very father of, of lies. So if you claim to be a follower of Christ and if you claim to have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a part of this race. So first of all, the reality of this race. But what must our goal be in this race? Is there an aim to be targeted? Look at the end of verse 24. Paul says, run in such a way that you may win. Goes on to say, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable prize or a wreath. The aim of the race. What is the aim of the race? It's to win the imperishable prize. Uh, Paul says, you are in this race, you are to run in such a way that you may win. You know, the athlete enters the competition with the goal of winning the event, not losing it. A sports shoe company ran an advertisement in uh, the 1996 Atlanta Olympics with this line. It said, you do not win the silver medal, you lose the gold. Uh, we are uh, to participate in this, what I've called as the amazing race, not with a defeatist attitude, not with a lazy or a fatalistic attitude, but we are to participate in this race with an attitude to win. Uh, this is not a stroll in the park or a ride in the amusement park, but an activity with a purpose, with an aim. And Paul is encouraging the believers in Corinth to run the race of the Christian life to obtain the prize. Paul, in this case, then, is shooting for the imperishable price. The ultimate aim of our race 
is, of course, the glory of God. It is to be grounded in the word of God. It is for the advancement of the gospel of God and ultimately resulting in the lives that are transformed for God. Uh, is Paul saying that only one Christian will receive the prize? No, no. There are many winners in the Christian race, but all should run as though they are going to win. Uh, the point of the comparison is not that the prize, uh, that the, only one wins the prize, but the attitude that we bring to this race. And unlike the modern Olympics where there are three medals that are awarded to the first three places in the ancient Isthmian games that I referenced earlier, only one winner received the crown. There was no second place award. And therefore winning was everything to this participant. And those who won the, the, the competition, they were given a prize that was very perishable. It was made of celery, uh, but of course it, had, it represented something more. It represented fame and, and popularity and perhaps life as being a hero. However, the crown itself that Paul is talking about and the reason why he calls it perishable is that within a few hours, perhaps a few days, uh, it, it, it would perish. It would be no more. But Paul is pointing us to a prize that is imperishable. He says the crown that he's referencing is the imperishable prize. Uh, the word, interestingly, for crown is the word Stephanos from where we get our English word Stephen. And the scriptures actually talk about five different crowns. They're connected with different activities of our participating in the race. I just want to quickly refer to what those are. First of all is the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing. What it is in reference to is, it, is, is that it is mentioned in reference to converts. You don't have to turn there, but 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul in writing to the Thessalonians says, For who is our hope? Who is our joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? So first of all, the crown of rejoicing. Secondly, the crown of life. This crown is mentioned in connection with those who have undergone or will undergo intense persecution and difficult times as a believer. In James chapter 1, verse 12, our Lord's half-brother writes, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. John, in writing in Revelation, in chapter 2, verse 10, says, Do not fear for what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. But be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. It's the crown of life in reference to those who have undergone or will undergo persecution. Thirdly, the crown of righteousness. Uh, it's mentioned in connection with those who will long for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who will long for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, in his last epistle, 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, he writes, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We can tend to get distracted as we run this race as a believer, but look at what Paul writes about the different crowns. Fourthly, the crown of glory. The crown of glory. It's mentioned in connection with leaders and, and shepherds, for those who, who serve the Lord in different ministries and gifts that God has given him or her. First Peter 5, 1 to 4, Peter writing says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, but not under compulsion, but voluntarily. And in verse 4 he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown, the unfading crown of glory. And Paul's fourth reference comes to us in the verse that we have just read, the incorruptible or imperishable crown. It's mentioned in connection with those who have run or will run the Christian race faithfully. Everyone who competes in the game 
exercises self-control, Paul says, they then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. What would we do with all these crowns, you'll ask? Because aren't we doing everything for the glory of God? Answer, yes. You don't have to turn there, but Revelation 4.10, in writing about what we would do with these crowns, writes, John writes, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. We do everything we do for the glory of God. We are to run in such a way, Paul says, that we are aiming for the goal. And one of the ways to win or to aim for the goal is to do things with excellence. Uh, we are to do everything we do with excellence. And men and women throughout the scriptures, and perhaps you have had examples in your own life who have aimed at doing things with excellence. You know, Paul reminds the Colossians in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. The Lord reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are to do everything in our power to do it to succeed. But you know, the, the greatest definition of succeed, success comes from the Lord himself. In giving instructions to Joshua in chapter 1, you remember in chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, he says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And then in verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, for you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. So we are to aim for success. The kind of success that the scripture talks about is us being faithful to God and his word. Uh, to, to be successful is not to be looking for shortcuts but to be willing to persist and endure till the end. You know, last week we heard Pastor Rocky talk about the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards. And Ed Edwards captures this particular attitude in one of his resolutions, which happens to be his first. He says, resolution one, I will live for God. I will live for God. Resolution two, if no one else does, I still will. Well said. The aim then is the imperishable crown. But to receive the imperishable crown, there is an expectation from us. There's a certain conduct from you and I that is expected uh, in, in this race. We are, to we are to conduct ourselves in a certain way. And that brings me to my third point, which is our conduct in the race. Our conduct in the race. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27, it says, Everyone who competes in the games exercises what? Self-control in all things. Uh, they then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Paul goes on to say, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. You know, at the Isthmian games that I referenced earlier, Paul, which Paul had in mind as he's writing this, Every athlete took an oath. You know, these games were held in, in the Greek god, uh, god Poseidon's name, uh, which was the god of the sea. And at the center of the site of the game was a temple to this particular god. And inside this temple was a small building called the Palaimon. Uh, and this is where the athletes took an oath. Essentially, they would take the oath to obey by the rules of the game and not to cheat. Otherwise, they would be faced with disqualification. Uh, Paul uses the same word disqualification at the end of verse 27 uh, to tell us what we do not or what he does not want to face. Now, I want to be careful here. Disqualification in this sense that Paul is using does not mean that you will lose your salvation. Otherwise, he would be contradicting himself in his own writing, and he would be contradicting what our Lord says. Remember in John 6, 39, our Lord says, This is the will of who sent me, that, all of, of, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. So you are not going to lose your salvation, but you will lose your rewards. 
And Paul talks about that particular judgment of believers in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Uh, here at Countryside, we believe and teach the eternal security of the believer. Uh, I took this from our doctrinal statements, uh, statement which says, we believe and teach that all the redeemed, once saved, persevere in their faith because they are kept by God's power and thus are secure in Christ's forever. We believe and teach that it is the privilege of believers to rejoice in the assurance of their salvation through the testimony of God's word, which, however, clearly forbids the use of Christian security as an occasion for sinful living and carnality. Just because you are a believer, that doesn't give you freedom, and Paul talks a lot about that in Romans, doesn't give you the freedom to live the way you want. And as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have taken an oath too. We have made a commitment to trust and to follow Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Your allegiance is to, to him. And our conduct then in this race is dictated by what God has told us in his word. You know, the story is told of Emperor Nero, who was the emperor uh, in one of those games, who was at Corinth, and he was there to inaugurate uh, an Isthmian can uh, canal project. And while he was there, he wanted to himself compete in the, in the games. And so the organizers of the event accommodated him, changing some dates here and there as, uh, as they were expected to do, because here was an emperor who wanted to participate in the games. And one of the competitions was also singing. And uh, Nero wanted to be singing. And so um, Suetonius, who writes about this event, he tells us that he described Nero's voice as weak and husky. Uh, one of Nero's generals, uh, probably tongue-in-cheek, called it a divine voice. Uh, perhaps it wasn't that great. Uh, but, the singing but the singing competition did not involve just one song, but a whole list of other singers who were there. And it lasted for several hours. Uh, and this, uh, Suetonius, who writes about this event, describes some very humorous events that transpired while Nero was singing. Uh, he writes, while he was singing, no one was allowed to leave the theater, even for the most urgent reasons. <laughs> and so it is said that some woman who wanted to give birth to children had to give it right there and then itself. There was only one way to, uh, to come out of the theater if someone was feigning to be dead, and so they had to take him or her out for funeral, and that's how you came out of the theater. But this is hardly a description of a prize-winning singer or a performance. Uh, but Nero, no surprise there, won all the contests that he participated in. <laughs> and he, he, perhaps he won because of two reasons, as the writer will tell us. He either threatened his competition or he bribed the judges in offering them a Roman citizenship. He twisted the rules to suit his purposes. And that's the only way that he won. Nero's morality in that sense was based on his own will, which is very arbitrary. Uh, this is so unlike the God that we see in, in the scriptures, whose decisions are based on his nature and are not arbitrary. He's a righteous God, as we looked at a couple of weeks back, and all his decisions are based on his being just and righteous. You and I don't make up rules for this race, no. Instead, we follow what God has already laid down for us in his word. I remember when our, my oldest daughter was very young uh, and we would go through memorizing scriptures with her, uh, there would come a point where she was very exhausted because some of the verses tended to be long. And she would ask me, Dad, can I make up my own verses to memorize? <laughs> and I would have to remind her, no, no, we don't make up verses uh, as Moses reminds in Deuteronomy, and then John again reminds in Revelation, there is nothing that we should be adding or taking out of these words that, that are God's words. And so this is a reminder to us that we don't add to what God has already given to us in his word. Notice, first of all, Paul says that those who compete, they must exercise one quality, which is self-control. Self-control in all things. Uh, the word means to keep one's emotions or impulses or desires under control uh, or control oneself or abstain from doing 
things. Now, of course, in a topical message such as this, we can lose sight of the context. Uh, Paul has written 1 Corinthians, as I mentioned earlier, to, to respond to some questions that have come uh, to, to him. Uh, in chapters 8 to 10, he's responding to some certain questions that, that he wants to respond to. In chapter 8, he addresses the question of meat offered to idols. And in this chapter, before we come to these verses, Paul is talking about uh, different questions that have come to him. He's talking about the liberty that he has and how he must exercise his liberty when it comes to uh, questions such as meat that is offered to idols. Now, this particular word, self-control, is rarely used in the New Testament. It's only used two times. And both of those times, Paul is the one who's using it. He uses that in chapter 7. Remember when he teaches about singleness. And, and the second time he uses it here. Uh, Paul is saying to us that he wants to do, or we must do as followers of Christ, everything in our power so that, that, that we have access to share the gospel. It is a word that is used both for doing something or withholding yourself from doing something. If consuming meat offered to idols is going to offend a weaker brother, Paul writes earlier in chapter 9 and 8, then I'm not going to do it. John MacArthur in his commentary says, it simply tells us that for the sake of the goal towards which he strives, the commission which he has been given and the task which he must fulfill, he refrains from all the things which might offend or hamper. It is not for his own sake or for the sake of any necessity to salvation, but for the sake of the brethren that he practices. In this race, then, that is said before us, one of the first things that is expected from us is self-control. It is to participate in the activities that you must participate and to withdraw yourself from activities that you need to withdraw yourself from. Those activities may not necessarily be sin in themselves, but we need to stop doing certain things so that it would not offend a weaker brother or a weaker sister. I turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The author of Hebrews writes, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Secondly, the writer of Hebrews says we are to lay aside or to shed or to get rid of everything that slows us down. If you are a runner, you know that one of the greatest problems a runner faces is that of weight. And unless you get rid of some extra weight, you cannot expect to be faster than you are. In the case of the audience the writer of Hebrews has in mind, it was, it was the Judaistic legalism that was a part of them. And they were holding on to it so much so that it was slowing their progress in Christ. And the writer reminds them that they need to shed, get rid of everything that holds them back or slows them down in this race. Anything that adds to us, that slows us down, we must get rid of, and get rid of it very, very harshly and brutally, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, for some of us, it might be some extra time that we spend in, in front of the television, uh, which compels us to spend time away from things of the Lord. Uh, for some of us, it could be fellow Christians that could be eating into our time, that could be slowing us down. Uh, while they are in the race, they're perhaps just sitting and loitering around on the tracks, slowing us down even further. The Lord reminds us in Luke 21, be on guard so, they are, so that your hearts would not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come as you suddenly, and that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. In Colossians 3.8 it says, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Anything and everything that is holding you back or slowing you down, the writer of Hebrews is saying, lay it aside. If there is a sin that you are struggling with, uh, seek counsel. Go to God's word. Uh, see what it says. Paul in, in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 talks about putting on and, and putting off. Uh, we are to be involved with things that, that help us get closer to our aim, to our goal. And we are to refrain from doing things that take us further away 
from our goal. And thirdly, our conduct must be marked by endurance, by endurance. Now, endurance, as we read in, in chapter 12, verse 1 of Hebrews, endurance is that quality that shows steady determinations that keeps going. It's the ability to keep going when every cell in our body wants to slow down or give up. Uh, we've heard about some prayer requests earlier in the evening. And perhaps the temptation is to, to slow down as, as we look at our own sicknesses. But the writer of Hebrews is telling us, keep at it. Keep at it, even when no one is looking or no one is recognizing you. Perhaps you've just registered yourself to volunteer in one of the ministries on our campus. Uh, perhaps you've seen no one recognizing you for, for your efforts. And the writer of Hebrews is encouraging us, telling us to keep at it, endure, don't give up. The word race that is used here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, is the word agon, uh, from where we get the word agony. We are to lay aside, get rid of everything that slows us down, everything that hinders us from our goal, everything that shifts our focus from the aim that we ha have, we are to lay it all aside. And we are to deal and deal decisively with every sin that entangles us. John Owen rightly calls mortifying the sins, mortifying the sins. And such a life that is marked by self-control, such a life that is marked by laying aside all the weights uh, and dealing with sins decisively, such a life that is marked by endurance will absolutely be different from those who are not running the race. Uh, that's why here at Countryside, one of our distinctives, which is a non-negotiable principle that guides the choices and decisions that we make in the church's ministry, is a high view of Scripture. And one of the contemporary application of that distinctive is a changed life. Uh, I, I picked it up from our distinctive. We believe that all those whom God has genuinely saved by grace through faith alone are new creatures in Christ and will demonstrate the new life by submission to Christ and to obedience to God's word. All Christians still sin, sometimes horribly, and sometimes for extended periods without repentance, uh, but a decreasing pattern of sin and an increasing pattern of holiness will characterize every Christian's life. Our conduct in the race should be marked by self-control, by laying aside things that, that get in our way, and thirdly, by, by an attitude of endurance. When such a foundational change has taken place, such a life will be very, very different, will be radically different. We've considered the reality of the race, the aim of the race, our conduct in the race, and now we consider our example in the race. Our example in the race. How is it that we can be successful in this race? How is it that, can be, that we can be shown as faithful in the race that is set before us even as we were singing earlier? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now just to give you a context, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 has just taken the recipients of this episode through a list of men and women who were the heroes of faith. Rightly, someone has called this the Hall of Faith. They have endured severe persecution and in many cases have been martyred for their faith. Uh, perhaps you've come in this race as a believer after a lot of battles yourself. And while you're in this race, you may have faced a lot of hurdles and, and, and difficulties even in the past. You have perhaps stumbled coming out of the blocks. Uh, perhaps you are in a battle even right now. Perhaps you are finding yourself struggling financially or emotionally or relationally. The solution the writer of Hebrews is, is going to tell us is not to give up or prematurely raise your hands just because you know that you've already, the ultimate victory has already been won. No, no, it is to endure through the race and to keep your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the very author and perfecter of your faith. In 1968, four athletes were sent 
on a long journey from East Africa to Mexico City in pursuit of Tanzania's first ever Olympic medal. And while none of those participants returned with a gold or silver, the name of one man from that particular competition stood out and endures to this day as a source of inspiration to many athletes. His name, John Stephen Akwari. Now, despite hailing from the home of Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, a long-distance aquari was not used. Long-distance runner aquari was not used to training in the types of conditions that Mexico City offered. Uh, the Mexican capital, as some of you know, was 2,300 meters above the sea level. And while world records tumble in the sprint races uh, and the field races, the line, the field that lined up for the marathon race uh, faced a, a formidable challenge in which. John Aquari was participating. And Aquari was on the back foot right from the beginning of the race as he faced cramps because of the high altitude. But he was determined to improve his position. But he was also then involved in a pileup uh, with some other athletes near the halfway point of the race, uh, which caused him to suffer uh, bruises and dislocation of his right knee, right in the middle of the race. He also had a bruised shoulder because of the pileup. Aquari, while he was still running, was advised by passerbys and, and experts to pull out of the race. Indeed, 18 of those 75 athletes who started that race uh, did not finish it. But he continued. And after receiving some treatment while during the course of the race, he put a bandage to his knee and elected to continue to run. One Olympic commentator while he was running said, a voice calls from within to go on, and so he goes on. Another Ethiopian runner by the name Walde, uh, he was more comfortable with the added altitude and was crossing the finish line to claim the gold. Aquari was laboring in a distant last place, but his never-say-die spirit remained. And as darkness fell and the crowd filtered out in the Olympic Stadium in Mexico City, a lone figure embarked on the final 800 meters of his journey. Television crews rushed back and to their spot to capture the moment that Aquari limped over the finish line over an hour after the winner's time of two hours and 20 minutes. When asked why he persevered in these punishing circumstances, Aquari uttered one of the most memorable and inspirational lines in the history of the games. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. As a follower of Christ, as an authentic disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has placed you in this race. And he has placed you to finish the race. Some of us are going through difficult times even right now. And the writer of Hebrews encourages us to keep at it. Do not give up. Uh, not only our fellow believers are running with you, God himself, the author of this race, the author of your life, the creator of who you are and who, who, uh, who has created everything, he is with you. You know, Isaiah 41.10, what a wonderful promise. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You have the presence of God with you and the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in front of you. You are here to finish the race and finish it well. But how can you do that? How is the Lord Jesus Christ an example? The writer reminds us here that he is the author and perfecter of faith. The author and perfecter of faith, which is to say that he is the supreme and perfect example of what faith constitutes. He shows us what a faithful runner should be like. Earlier in Hebrews, you don't have to turn there, but Jesus is referred to as the author of salvation. Here he is referred to as the author of faith. Uh, he is referred to as one who is tempted in all things as we are, and yet without sin. We read in the Gospels, and some of us in adult Sunday schools are going through either the Gospel of John or, or, or the Gospel of Luke, that whatever hardship and suffering that Jesus anticipated, he always fully trusted the Father. In Matthew 26, 39, he writes, Matthew writes, and he went a little beyond them. Remember, this is just before 
uh, Jesus' capture to be crucified, he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He always desired his father's will. Uh, and while the witnesses mentioned in chapter 11 uh, of Hebrews were wonderful examples of faith, Jesus' example was far superior to theirs. It was superior because without Christ's faithfulness, no believer's faith would count for anything. In fact, that is why the writer of Hebrews writes the epistle of Hebrews. Uh, the theme of this epistle, as some of you know, is the superiority of Christ. Christ is superior in his person. Uh, Christ is superior in his work. And he's superior in the perseverance and the obedience as an example of faith. He's also an example to our faith because he's the perfecter of our faith. The one who carried it through to completion. He could say that from the cross, it is finished. He completed the work and he perfected it. That is, he brought it to its conclusion. Secondly, he shows us a single-minded focus on the goal that, is, that was in front of him. Hebrews 12, uh, verse 2, at the end he says, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, uh, despising the shame or disregarding the shame that came with being on the cross and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross. He despised the shame that came with it because of the joy that was set before him. Uh, Jesus was able to endure the cross because he knew it was leading uh, to the Father's presence where there is fullness of joy and the Father's right hand where there are pleasures forevermore. He is our example then in his single-minded focus on the goal that was before him. Brothers, sisters, uh, are you going through difficult times? Uh, perhaps you don't see the finish line yet. And going through uh, some difficult challenges, even right now, health challenges, sicknesses, loss of a dear one, perhaps loss of a job, a strained relationship. Uh, perhaps you are singled out at your workplace and mistreated by someone who, uh, who does that for no apparent reason. The writer of Hebrews is reminding us, uh, take heart. Take heart. Look at Jesus. As we were singing earlier, keep your eyes fixed on uh, Jesus, consider him. Uh, rightly, the songwriter Helen Lemon, uh, uh, in, in putting these lyrics to the song, she writes, and turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full on his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Uh, not that your problems will go away, but it will give you the kind of perspective you and I need to have uh, at life's issues and problems. It is to fix our mind on the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're sitting here and you are telling yourself, perhaps your question is, I'm not even a part of this race. I don't think I'm a part of this race. You know, Paul reminds you in Romans, it says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Uh, for with a heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with a mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. And so, we've looked at what the reality of the race is, is that we are all participants in this race. We looked at the aims of the race. We looked at our conduct in the race, which should be marked by self-control. It should be marked by endurance. It should be marked by laying aside all the things that hold us back. But what makes this race amazing is not all of these things, but it is the one who's, who is, should be or who should be our focus, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement that we receive from your word, for the reality that we are participants in this race. Uh, for the one on whom our eyes must be fixed in all circumstances. And while Paul begins in Galatians reminding us that we are in a race, he ends his life the same way as he writes in, in his last episode that, that he has fought the good fight, that he has finished the course, that he has kept the faith. And may that be true of every one of us who is sitting here, who has placed our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
that we have, that we have fought the good fight, uh, that we have finished the course, the race that was set before us, and that we have kept the faith. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the very author and perfecter of our faith, uh, who endured the cross, uh, who, who, who did not regard the shame that came with it, but for the joy that was set before him, so that we, who are his followers, we would not grow weary, even as we consider him who is the very author and perfecter of our faith. Help us, Lord, then, to do just that. We ask all these things in the most precious and worthy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.